sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Singing, oh, how I love Jesus. scripture reading real quick and it'll be coming from Psalms 133 and it says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity it is like the precious oil poured on the head running down on the beard running down on Aaron's beard down on the collar of his robe it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion for there the Lord bestows his blessing even life forevermore let us recite the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like that. Yes, sir. 
A good follower? Yes. Okay. A good listener? I love those things. Someone who leads by example. Someone who leads by example. Absolutely. Now, those are the traits of a leader. Those are the good traits of a leader. Anybody else? Anybody else? What's the definition of a leader? Yes, ma'am. It's the person who leads or commands a group or organization. Someone who leads or commands a group of an organization. Okay. Now, someone who has the title leader, are they truly the leader? Not Can they be truly the leader? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Why is that?
Hope y'all writing this stuff down. Okay, empower others, humility, and self-aware. Hmm, interesting. I, I like that. Those are some of the great traits of a leader. Now, as a leader, I hope y'all writing some of this stuff down. As leaders, leaders always write stuff down. Leaders always ensure that they can always take knowledge back and always learn. Because a leader is constantly and consistently learning from others. Because the Bible says we have not attained it all. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Servant leadership, being able to set kneecap and kneecap with people to hear them, to hear them out, and to move. And we're gonna hear, we're gonna see, we're gonna see a video about that. And we're gonna see, we're gonna see how that kneecap, the kneecap servant leadership works. Being a, it's a cartoon, but you always see how it would actually work as well. Absolutely. So here it is. Outstanding question. So leadership is intangible. It's hard to measure. Sometimes it's hard to describe. But the thing about it is, is the ability to control and direct self-confidence based on expert knowledge, initiative, loyalty, pride, and a sense of responsibility. One of the key things about leaders is initiative. No one should be able to tell you what to do, how to do it. No one should be able to push you. You should be pulling others with you as a leader. You should. If someone has to push you, you're not a leader. Someone might poke you and be like, hey, everything all right? I'm not saying leaders can't take a knee to take a breather. A breather. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that if someone got to constantly, consistently tell you to, to go here, to go there, are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? And you're really not a leader. You just have a position of a leader. And then also loyalty. You know, your loyalty is not broken among a lot of things. If you're a leader, then you and your ministry and those who you lead, that's who you love. And you love that ministry to actually see it to come to fruition, but also to ensure that all the task and purpose are done in that ministry. You can't be here, there, and everywhere. And then also, it says here, leadership is influence. It came from over here. Leadership is influence. How can I inspire you to do the right thing? You have to find out how to tap into people's core beliefs. Just like President Barack Obama, when he gave his inauguration speech, his speech of acceptance, when he won the night of uh, his presidency, he stepped on that stage and he tapped into everybody's core values. Leaders ought to be speaking so much so that they're able to tap into people's core values. It's not just a black, white, male, female, woman thing. No, what is the core values of being a human? That's the things that we want to tap into. Those are the things we want to tap into. All right, we're going to listen to a quick video. Real quick. Business leaders care about 
and how that information influences the ways in which they choose to lead. So today I'll be discussing how the combination of transparency, accountability, love, empathy, and curiosity combine to create world-class and effective leaders. Now, as I move through this, I want to ask you all to reflect on the leaders in your life, whether that's a boss, a parent, or an elected official. How do they grade against this criteria? How can you push the leaders in your life to be better and to create more change within your life? So to begin, let's talk about accountability. So accountability is all about understanding your own place as a leader. It's understanding that when it matters most, you own the decisions and the outcomes. So this goes two ways, right? It goes when things are really good. How can you hold people accountable to success? How do you assign to people praise and recognition? But it's also about when things don't go well, right? So how do you hold people accountable, both yourself and others, when things go poorly? How do you react and change in real time? And how do you begin to have dialogues with folks who don't react to the culture you're trying to set? Right, because you're, everyone's trying to drive cultures of change, of success, and expectations of excellence. So how do you as a leader begin to, begin to create that change? And this goes into curiosity, right? So effective leaders are always curious. They rethink the problems that they face every day. They avoid either or fallacies and strong man, and strong man arguments and try and find real solutions to problems. They ask the right questions to the right people at the right time to continue to have an open mind and redefine how they view the world. These leaders will constantly be seeking to change the norm. They improve and create a standard and a foundation for change and excellence wherever they go. And this leads in to transparency, which is all about keeping people in the loop, right? So a leader will understand the stakeholders in any organization. So whether that's an elected official, how does legislation you're trying to push, how does that impact people? Whether you're a business leader, understanding how your customers or your employees are going to be affected by the things and the choices that you make. They avoid anger and apathy by having real conversations with people who are gonna understand what's going on. And this leads us into love. Leaders who love what they do. They identify with their purpose, with their people and with the team themselves. They understand that what they're trying to do is so important. It's not just about earning money, it's not just about doing something for the sake of doing it. What they're doing matters. And there's a reason why they do this every single day. And there's a reason why people are attracted to them, they're magnetic, they're charismatic. They identify with their team because they understand that as a team you are better. Success together is better than success alone, and working together creates strong bonds together. And they identify with the individuals on their team because they understand that their purpose is bigger than themselves. They're a group, they're a team, and these people on this team care about this just as much as they do. It creates a strong sense of oneness, of togetherness, and strong bonds and camaraderie. And leaders who do this also have a very strong sense of empathy. They understand how to have real discussions with people about the things that they care about the most. They understand how to have discussions with people so they feel heard, so they understand what's going on. They listen to people. They understand the problem they're facing and they find real solutions to problems. So, to wrap this up, effective leaders are empathetic, curious, transparent, accountable, and have a love for the things in their life. Now, at the beginning of this, I asked all of you to reflect on the leaders in your life. After hearing this, how do they grade? If you have leaders in your life who are very successful, how do you begin to push them and challenge them to be better? When the leaders in your life fail you, how do you have a dialogue with them to begin to push and challenge them to do more than they're doing, to enact change and to serve your organizations? But more than that, how do you grade? What do you do? How do the leaders in your life grade you? And how do the people you lead think about you? What can you do yesterday, or what can you do today, excuse me, that's better than you were yesterday? 
and what can you do tomorrow to make you a better leader than you were today? Because at its core, in 50 years, who's talking about you? What are they saying? Because for you to accomplish anything with anyone, someone has to do it at the head and lead. Thank you. All right. These are the things that he talked about. Accountability, curiosity, transparency, love, and empathy. These are the foundations of what he talks about, effective leadership. Accountability. How can we be accountable for success? but also accountable that we don't want to talk about for those particular failures. We don't want to talk about what went wrong because we want to blame people. But as a leader, guess what? If we're a success, it is the people who did it. If it's a failure, then I must have done something wrong. One of the key things that happened, I'll tell you what happened in Mount Calvary one time. We, uh, we went ahead and we purchased a stove. We purchased a stove. We purchased a stove and it was a great stove but one of those, one of the things we failed to take into accountability was the hood. The hood itself cost more than the stove. So we bought the stove for four thousand dollars, but the hood cost eight thousand dollars. <laughs> of course, we didn't budget for that at all. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So next thing you know, it got before the church, and we told the church, like, listen, we bought the stove, we wanted a commercial stove, but one of the things we failed to take a look at is the actual hood. And then when we presented that, I told them, I said, you know what? I, as your pastor, I'm sorry. I failed to do that. I failed to uh, have the leaders to take a look into how much the school, the actual hood, actually cost at all. And, you know, and as the pastor, I take full responsibility for this. So, but we're going to make this thing right and move this thing forward. Now, under, un under credit, underneath that was a trustee. Uh, two trustees and a deacon who basically made the purchase who was supposed to have done the research and when they did you know, when they failed to do the research guess what then it's kind of like we bought the stove and no good and I'm like okay how are we going to get this across the church and when I presented it to the church I took full responsibility and one of the deacons came unto me and said hey Pastor Thomas um, you took full responsibility Ability for that, and you didn't have anything to do with the purchase. I said, I know. I said, but as the leader, I take full responsibility for what happens and what does not happen in this particular church. And as a leader, if something fails, the buck stops with me. This buck stops with me. And I tell you that as leaders, is that it's uncomfortable. <laughs> it is uncomfortable to say when things go wrong. But guess what? Accountability has to start somewhere, and it starts with the leader. And it's okay. If you do something wrong, it's okay. As long as you are moving to try to right things, try to right the wrong that is happening. Curiosity. Always think through solutions that you talked about. Think through solutions. Hey, what are other ways that we can push the ministry forward? What are other ways we can do in the marketing department? What are other ways that we can say and inquire? What other instruments we can bring in? What other ways that we can be a trustee and, 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 and get different fundraising activities in here? You know, no one should be able to push. You should be throwing ideas at the past and be like, oh, 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 calm down, calm down. Hey, let us figure out what we want to do. You ought to come with so many ideas that, guess what? Every single ministry ought to be thriving and flourishing because you are curious and you want to make sure that every single ministry that you're part of is flourishing. Transparency. The problem with transparency, watch this, is that not a lot of people like to communicate. There are sacred silos of people of cliques and crews in a ministry that we don't want to talk about. People are making decisions over here, but then when something happens, then the person who's part of the ministry is like, when did we decide that? There was no transparency, and as a leader, I don't care how long people have been friends, I don't care if your family members inside of the ministry, or what have you, transparency across the ministry is vitally important. For the edifying of the saints, no one would have the same gift. But we have to learn how to appreciate everybody's gift, what everybody brings to the table. Yes, ma'am. Somebody else is stronger than 
error that you make. Like that doesn't take away from your leadership because you're able to cast a vision and show people where to go. You know, and that's the thing about it is that we as leaders should be comfortable in our own skin and stop designing everybody else's gift, but work on the gift that God has given you. Because if you don't work on the gift that God has given you, then part of the body of Christ is going to falter. Because so many people are trying to be like everybody else. I see it all the time in preachers. They try to be like Dr. Marcus Cosby, Rudolph McKissick Dream. They try to be like Bishop T.D. Jakes and all that. Be yourself. Preach yourself. And I'm like, if you want you to be yourself, guess what? God can use you because you're not trying to be like everybody else. Because there's no two snowflakes alike. There's no two leopards on a, there's no two spots on a leopard that are alike. There's no twi two twins uh, that are alike. There's no two alcohols that are alike. There's no two fingerprints that are alike. God has made you in his image. Bible says you are wonderfully <laughs> made. You are wonderfully made. And then the thing about it is, what can you do today to make you better than you know tomorrow? Have you assessed yourself? Have you assessed your fellows? Can you be humble with yourself and say, I failed in this and I failed in that? All right, leaders. Let us be mindful of those God has chosen and anointed to be called as leaders. First Thessalonians 5 20 says, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and a whole heart of love because they are working and have peace to live peacefully with one another. For the body of Christ, we need to recognize leaders. The problem that we have in today's society, in today's church, in today's area is that everybody, we'll get to this, that everybody wants to be a leader. And no one wants to follow. And, certain, and, and like you said, certain leaders, depending on what it is, got to learn how to follow. They have to learn how to follow. There are some things that my wife do better than me. And I just follow her. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What do you need me to do? It doesn't take away from who I am. That's. Yeah, I might have a doctoral degree. I might have a master's degree. I have a bachelor's degree. But someone who don't have a degree can probably be good in an area of ministry that I'm just going to follow. I have the greatest intercessory prayer warrior in the world. I say that because she's following the church. I can say all of that. And she leaves it every Wednesday at 12. And I follow behind her intercessory prayer every day of the week. She knows how to call on the Lord. She knows how to pray for people. She knows how to do all these things. Teach your pastor how to do this. Because she's gifted in that. I got all this stuff going on. 27 years in the military, Lieutenant Colonel, all that good stuff. But I'm listening to someone who don't have a degree. Can you humble yourself to do that? And that's what they're saying, is that you are know, anointed to be called leaders. And leaders know what the anointing, guess what? You cannot do leadership on your own. God is the one who has anointed you for this. And guess what? I'm going to be honest with you again. It's not some magic bullet that you're going to, not magic, you're not seeing the matrix. Come on, man, you're not seeing the matrix. You know, you take a magic pill and then all of a sudden you're either in the matrix or you're outside of the matrix and all that good stuff and everybody got the special powers. God does not give you a special power of knowledge right then and there. He gives you grace and favor so when you do walk, the things that would have tripped you up do not trip you up. But it's a leader's responsibility to get knowledge, to get understanding. To read and to research. Because in, in, in seminary, uh, yes, the Holy Spirit calls us all to preach. <laughs> but my professor said, give the Holy Spirit something to work with. Bro. The knowledge, the understanding, your availability, your obedience. The anointing will come. The anointing will flow. And so many people get the anointing wrong. It's kind of like, I got the anointing. I got the anointing. Yes, you got the anointing. But what are you doing to help develop that? Peter, James, uh, they, uh, the disciples were anointed, but they had to follow Jesus to understand the practicality of their call. And as leaders, who are you following? Is it Facebook? Is it Fox News? 
Is it NMC? Is it CNA? Is it Steve Hobby? Is it Oprah with? Huh? Well, 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 you should be on Let's follow this right here. The word. How did Jesus operate in certain situations? He was anointed. But yet, he didn't start his ministry until he was 30 years old. His father found him, his parents found him where? Inside the temple. 12 years old. You had us worried! Don't you know I'm about, I'm about my father's business? The question is, are you about your father's business? As leaders. As leaders. But then also the basis. The basis of being a leader. What are your standards? What is the standard of being a leader here at Fort Baptist? What is the standard of being a leader in your ministry? This is a list that was taken from a church in Jackson. And it says that what are the standards? Be a time and have to be committed to the church. Absolutely. One of the qualifications of being a leader. I'm in the process of getting a divorce. That's what this church is all about. Not cohabiting or shack it up. That is their standard. Not practicing homosexual or lesbianism. That is a standard that they set. Not be engaged in substance abuse. Can't be smoking weed and drinking alcohol and stay drunk all the time. What they say. Be active in ministry at church. Can, do I see you in Sunday school? Do I see you in Bible study? Do I see you in worship services? Do I see you in special services? Be in regular attendance in Bible study, Sunday school, those things. This is a standard to which a church is holding their leaders to war. The question is, what are your standards as a leader? What standards are you holding yourself to? And you have to have those set of standards so you know where to measure yourself by. And those standards are found in the Bible. That's, you can go back to the Ten Commandments. That's what I keep. That's what I steal. That's what I commit adultery. That's what I love that neighbor as that self. Be meek, be kind. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Anybody know the fruit of the Spirit? Anybody know one fruit of the Spirit? Because the key. 
kingdom is very different than the world. Who, who, who loves that evidence? You did me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. That's what the world says. But the kingdom says, love your enemies. Do good to those who spitefully use you. So with that, I know that they're not acting according to principles. I'm not judging them. I just know what the principles are. And I know that they're not acting toward those principles. And if they're not acting toward those principles, then i got to ask the next question, are they saved? And then if they're not saved, let me introduce Jesus to them so that the Holy Spirit can transform them. Because the Bible says, be not conformed to them, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And renewing of your mind comes through in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where that comes in. So the world, yes, the world in and of itself is not going to act in a kingdom principle. Now, somebody is saved. And they have to confess Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's our conversation. Yeah, I love this. It's not specifically leadership, but when you're uh, evangelizing, mm -hmm. that's one of the questions you uh, face with. Are you judging? Yeah. Are you judging? No. I just want to introduce Jesus. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed? Him? You know, when Jesus said, I am the truth and the life, what does that mean? What are your spiritual beliefs? And they start talking about the spirit of the ancestors. Then we got to have another question. You know, this ain't going to come up today, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when they even don't pass, I like it. So, yeah. so it's not just that people feel like they're being judged because you are talking about a trans transforming their life. And all you're doing is just saying, hey, I want you to have eternal life. My belief is that without Christ, you don't have eternal life. What the Bible says is that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal. I believe that everyone, you know, that don't have Jesus, they're not going to gain. And you just come from a, a place of love. Some people want to hear it, some people not want to hear it. If they don't hear it, get the dust off your feet. Move on to the next person. And that's the thing about leaders. We hate rejection. We don't like to be rejected. Everybody likes to be loved. I like to be loved. You like to be loved. But once someone don't like you, what do you do? What do you do? Huh? You should move on. But what do we do? Try to make it right. Do what? Try to make it right. Try to make it right. We pray for them. I love that. Pray for them. You not liking me is not my problem. It's your problem. It is. I mean, unless I offended you, then we have a conversation. But if I'm just up here walking around and you don't like me, that's your problem. And what people think about you should have no effect on your self-worth. Because your self-worth is not gained by somebody else's opinion of you, but your self-worth is gained by what the Bible says about you. That's my values. About yourself. You're in for growth. Unify community of men and women. Love should be in every part of the church. Excellent honors God. I'm gonna tell you right now, I love excellence. Excellence honors God. Everything ought to be crisp, clean, and ready to go when you start thinking about God. Believe the church should be led by those with leadership gifts. And in pursuit of full devotion. These are values. The question is, what core values are you holding yourself towards? This is introspection. Do we have a set of core values for ourselves? Do we believe? When the last time have core values? And when the last time have we assessed our own being regarding core values? But then also, again, let's get, jump right into it. Live a passing and prayerful life. How many people fast? Don't answer that question. <laughs> I'm not answering that question. How many, how many people fast and pray? As leaders, Christian leaders, one of your top things that you need to do is pray and fast. Pray and fast. If we're not fasting, the question is, are we calling ourselves leaders? Oh, I'm going to challenge you to that more question. It's okay. You know, do you value your relationship with God more than anything else? Watch this more than your spouse. More than your kids. I'm saying, I'm not saying don't love your spouse. I'm not saying don't love your kids. But I'm 
relationship with God allows you to be the husband to your spouse or wife to your spouse. A relationship with God allows you to be the best father or mother to your children. Revelation requires intimacy and intimacy requires holiness. When the last time have we just prostrated ourselves before God and spent some time in the Word before God? Hmm? Last year, I had to I had to do something. I did something that I never did before. I spent 21 days fasting on nothing but war. Nothing but war. Never done it before. I do I do a lot of research and I looked at Miles Monroe. And when I did that, I was like, Lord, I've never done this before, but I know I need to set a standard for myself, but also set a standard for the church. If I believe that you are real, I need to go ahead and practice continually some of the principles of God. Don't get around fasting before, but not to this particular level. And as I was fasting and praying to God, God revealed one thing, one area of my life to me that I needed to work on. And that area was pride. I was very proud. I had no clue that I was proud. How I was proud for the pandemic happened. The pandemic happened. And as it rained, guess what? A royal church. Guess what, guys? Hey, we're going to get through this pandemic. Hey, follow me. I got it. I got it. I got it. I put everything on my back. From having pocket bracers, I was there setting up. I was setting down, turning back. I was directing everything. And then I'm tired by setting up. Then I got to preach. But I felt like that if I was not there, the church was going to falter and fail. As a leader, yes, I should have been in position. But from a value-based perspective, I had the wrong mindset. And God told me, you have to work on your pride. And I was like, well, and I had to repent of that thing. Because as I became more prideful, I knew it was like nothing will ever get done in that cavern unless I do. And that wasn't true. That wasn't true whatsoever. And I told the congregation, I'm not telling you something, I told the congregation. And I actually begin this from the entire congregation. Because as a pastor, as a leader, you got to know when you're wrong. But you also got to know when it's time to have people to see what God so God can show you what is going on in your life. Because if you don't know what's going on in your life, that means you don't have intimacy with God. And when you have intimacy with God, you'll be able to do great things for you. as well. But also, what are the responsibilities of a leader? Communicate vision, rules, and expectations. Be prophetic. Duplicate and leadership is vital. Who are you training to be the next? Who are you training to be the next? Why is training the next person to be the next is important? Why is that important? Y'all are ready to see the month that is on point. You're going to have to pass. Then, and then before that, at the time that you can, you should have stopped because you can't be there. You should have just still flowing. Burn out. I burn out. I fizzle. I, I fizzle. I fizzle out. I fizzle out. You know what? I fizzle out. I take some time away from the church because I fizzle out. But you got to learn how to duplicate leaders. In twelve disciples, Jesus didn't do it all, and He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you think that we can do it all? Do you think the position of title is a legal thing that means that we can, it, 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 it doesn't, the buck stops here, guess what? I'm going to do it all. It doesn't get done without me. It ain't going to get done. This is where you start talking about the mindset of the leader. Mindset of a leader. I can like a leader and a steward and not a dictator. spirit that was on Moses. What happened? He put it on those 70 people so that they can judge and even the hardest things actually come up to Moses. But one of the key things of leaders is that you will burn yourself out if you try to do it all by yourself. And the problem that I have that I'm still dealing with is time. 
I want it done and I want it done now. Yeah. I can dictate to majors and lieutenant colonels, hey, I need this done by Friday. I need to get it done. And I hold on down. It doesn't work that way in the church today, right now. It doesn't work that way in the church. You better plan out four months for something that can almost take a week to get done. And I'm, I, I'm being honest because everybody has a life, everybody's operated on different time and time spaces. And you as a leader need to understand that, hey, I need to focus on the things I need to get done, but also I need to allow people time to get the stuff done as well. Because some people might not know as much as you, and it might take them twice as long what it might take you one day to get it done. It might take them an entire week or two to get it done. But the question is, have you shown them a more excellent way? That's what they're talking about. Praise and love it, but chest highs and right. Have you ever been chastised in public? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Right. Lead because your team is watching you. As a leader, if you call yourself a leader, a ministry leader, a deacon, a trustee, a pastor, an associate, the eyes are on you. Eyes are on you. People are looking at you, looking at you. Whether you do the right thing or the wrong thing. And then you gotta have a shepherd's heart. Being able to lead, being able to care, all those things as well. But then also as a ministry leader, you are charged with great responsibility of the church. The pastor has given you a privilege to serve as a leader and as a follower. This means conducting yourself like a leader, following instructions, and building a team like a leader. But then also remember who the ministry is. It ain't your ministry. You may be in charge of it, but it ain't your ministry. You are a steward of that ministry. Because you have to have the pastor, the heart of the pastor, make sure you're taking careful observation and spending time with the pastor to know their heart. Has anybody asked a request times like, hey, pastor, you got a, you got a moment, pastor, let me take you out to eat, pastor, let me take you out to lunch, and just hear from the heart of the pastor? As leaders, as he's a busy man, don't get me wrong, I know how to but you got to have time to say, hey, Pastor, I want to hear from your heart. I want to know what you think, how you spend. And more than times than not, I don't have to have time with the I can just see how it leads. 90% of my leadership in the church came by observing Pastor Dave. <laughs> observing Pastor Dave. The question is, have you observed him enough to take on his heart to love the people in the church? When people see you, you have to see the heart of the pastor. When you speak to people, they ought to know that it's almost it is the same spirit that is speaking to them that is the pastor's spirit. Or do we speak to more harsh words? Or do we cuss them out? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then, leave us as a basis. Live a humble and transparent life. Stay open to correction. Order your actions regularly. And stay in touch with the real world. And don't allow people to make you into a celebrity. You leave better than the pastor. I don't know why she could ministry later in the first place. Shut foolishness down and cut it off at the root when you hear it. I don't care if they're kin to you. I don't care if you all are best buds and y'all go out to stop ups every third Thursday. The thing that will turn church apart is gossip. The thing that will turn, turn, to turn up people down is when you talk about them behind their back and then smile in their face like ain't nothing wrong. But then, what is the tension? The tension is compassion and strength. This is Jesus. He touched the lepers and showed tenderness to the woman with the issue of blood, but he also showed great strength. As he turned tables and money changes at the temple. He had compassion, but he also had strength. Intellect and emotion. He amazed the people with his grasp of scriptures at age 12. But yet, he deeply loved people at levels they emotionally felt. He also wept. He was knowledgeable, but he was able to empathize with people. 
the present and the future. Jesus first people where they were. He didn't ask broken people questions like, how in the world did you let yourself get in such a jail? He was a realist about human frailty. But then he also urged people to move forward. He told Zacchaeus, the tax collector, to make restitution. He accepted him where he was, but he urged him to move forward into the future of God's honor and way. Attention. Purpose and freedom. Here it is. Jesus knew why he had come, but he was bothered when his disciples didn't take his mission seriously. But yet he lived with an amazing sense of balance. He was never in a hurry, compulsive, and never forced people to do what he wanted them to do. He never forced people to do what they did not want to do. He knew his purpose. And if others embrace his purpose for them, it will be the best for them as well. Who are you forced to do your will in the ministry? If people don't want to do it, then fine, they don't do it. Let's move forward. Because you are not going to force people to do something that they don't want to do. I can't force you to do the right thing. As I told the money, I told the money, I said, yeah, I'm your uncle. I'm your dad. I said, I'm an advisor right now. Get she in college. I'm an advisor right now. You do what you want to do. I advise you not to do it. <laughs> You'll find out with yourself. You can advise people all day long what to do. But at the end of the day, it's their decision. You cannot force them to do anything. Righteousness and sensitivity. On the sensitive side, Jesus elevated the status of women so high that he even praised the woman. For what she was further in, in a further masculine role, sitting at the feet of Jesus, he praised her for sitting at the feet of, at, at, at his feet. But here it is, he was forceful. He was bumped with his mom. He said, listen, at the, listen, he's like, hey, that ain't my that ain't my plan. So you got to know righteousness and sensitivity. No one can make you do the right thing. But you always got to stand up for the right thing. But you also got to be sensitive as well. Because I always tell people, and I know it's a controversial issue about women's rights. I tell people all the time, I'm pro-choice. And I'm pro-life. People say, what are you talking about? It's up to them to get the choice. But don't ask me. I, 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 I like life. But at the end of the day, God made us make our own choices. And if God has made us make our own choices, who am I to take people's rights away? And it's the same thing right here. You don't take people's rights away. Jesus was sensitive enough to understand that. Are we sensitive enough to understand what people are at as well? But the true tension is this. There's too many chiefs. Look at everybody sitting around watching old Andre dig. Is this our ministry? Is this our church? Too many chiefs and not enough enemies. But one of the key things that you have to learn is to find the roles inside of your team in ministry. There's one leader, but everybody in the, everybody in the ministry has a role to play. And if they have a role to play, then everybody needs to understand their role. I think the most disagreements in a team and in a ministry comes in the fact that people don't know their place and they don't know their responsibilities. And if people understood their responsibilities inside the team, then guess what? You won't have tension going on. You won't. You won't have tension going on. But the true leader is all about attitude. They said that a lot of people get hired because of that attitude and 15% of knowledge. I can get along with anyone. If you have a great attitude, I can always send you to some training to get skills. But I cannot teach you attitude. I cannot teach you compassion. I cannot teach you loyalty. I can't teach you all of these things. But what I can teach you is skills. And if you have the right attitude to know that this, know that this ministry can move forward, guess what? A lot of things can happen. But here's a boss. So many people want to operate as a boss. Sit in a chair, go, move, do this, do that, do this, do that. But as a leader, a leader is out front, helping the ministry to pull forward. Come on, let's go. Providing direction, going here and going there. Question is, what type of leader are you? Are you a boss? 
understanding the different paintings and stuff like this. Be polymathic. Don't just stay in one area. Open yourself up to many areas. And then also be creative. Be very much creative. When the last time have you colored in a coloring book? I know it's simple. I know it's simple. It is. But I'm going to tell you one way to calm a person down, someone who's very angry. If you're angry, one way to calm yourself down is to go color. You're a color in a book, and start color. Why? Because you're operating one side of your brain because of anger, but you activate the other side of your brain when you start coloring and you start drawing. It works. Trust me. It works. It works. All right. Yes, sir. I got a comment. I want to make a comment. Um, the second you said, start with clients, you know, I always felt that it seemed like you when know, you do things in the church, and you know it's going to be a certain time. Like, what happens in the next month? And it always come up, and I get it happen. Um, people find that they can make that sacrifice to attend that moment. Even though if you were here in church, and you know we have a business, and we were notified like two months ago, weeks ago, and that's where I think they're not going to need to sacrifice time. You know, um, you got to separate you know, time to be here because we are the issue to get to church. Y'all don't get too personal. Right? And sometimes you always like, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm not going to. I don't know. No, I'm not sure about that. So I think some of the key things is, is leaders are not bought in, some leaders are not bought into the vision of the church. They're not bought into the vision of what ministry does, what a ministry does. Yeah. The reason why is because certain people got their own agenda. Yeah. They have their own leaders in title, but not in embodiment. And those leaders are showing them who they are. Y'all see what Khan, I love Khan. Khan is amazing. You know, when when T T Chala was about to, then was about to swear him up, and they basically mess him up. His head went backwards. Ramonta, come on, man, Angela Bassett said, show them who you are. He could have, he could have fell down, but he knew who he was. He said, I'm Prince T'Challa, king of, come on, man, y'all talk to me. And he won. People will show you who they are when critical time comes. When crisis occurs, see who's going to be in your corner. When it's time to be a leader, see who's around and if people miss more than what they're supposed to be at, then you know they're not a leader, but only a name only. Because true leaders will show up at all times. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get y'all on a 10-minute break. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's good that you say that because I have been working on something since October. And trust me, there was some days that I was looking at an office I was just ready to just have passed it. Everybody, I'm done, I'm through, I'm done. But I hung in there and I quit. I was about to leave to go out of town on a cruise. God worked it. It came right on through just in time. So I had to humble myself to say, okay, I can do this. I just got to hang in there and start to do it. So trust me, it was more. Please, please, sacrifice. Yes. Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you right now, and I'll let y'all go. Within a year and a half, I had to put three set of tires on my car. Within, within a year and a half, I probably spent over a little over eight thousand dollars in gas. I probably missed more of my daughter's volleyball tournaments than I really wanted. I'm here to let you know, leader sacrifice. I'm not boasting about myself. I'm here to let you know, whatever is important to you, you're going to need. That's why I say your feet does all the voting. Your feet do the voting. And if you go a leader, you're going to show up. You're going to sacrifice. It's going to hurt. Putting this brief together, it hurt this week. Why? It's because I just found out my cousin got cancer. I had to go down to the church to ratify our budget. I had to have another meeting this Thursday. I had to prepare for a retirement.
ceremony this particular week. But I knew what I had to do here on today. And as a leader, you're going to sacrifice time, sleep, and things that you really want to do because you want to show up where it's critical. And leaders show up at that critical. And if you don't show up, things will falter and things will fall. And the question is, are you considering yourself as a leader? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. So the next phase we're going to get into is called developing leaders. First, we define the leader. We have good conversations about that. But this next one, we're going to be talking about developing leaders. And then after that, we're going to be talking about deploying leaders. And then we're going to do a practical application. And we should be done uh, right at 1400, 2 o'clock for the non-military types in here. All right. Let's get into it. <clears throat> All right. This one to be the top version for me. He said, I try not to let anyone know this, 
but deep down, I am a very insecure person. Does this sound like Jay has a knowledge or skills issue that horizontal development can effectively address? No. What is going on here is that Jay has some insecurities about his self-worth that is probably connected back to some form of past trauma. And this insecurity is driving him to want to prove others wrong because that helps him to feel like he's of value and worth. And so when problems occur in his organization, to him it's a signal that he won't prove others wrong and therefore won't be of value and worth. So he steps in to micromanage because it helps him to feel better and more secure. And he has a hard time seeing the negative impact that has on those around him. To go back to the iPad analogy, Jay doesn't have an app problem, he has an operating systems problem. And if we want to help Jay develop and operate as a more effective leader, we've got to use a form of development that is different than what is typical. It's a form of development that's called vertical development. Vertical development is a form of leadership development that is all about upgrading leaders' internal operating systems. It carries three assumptions. First, it assumes that if leaders aren't operating effectively, it's because they have fears and insecurities that are causing them to self-protect. And this has negative ramifications for those they lead. Second, it assumes that these fears and insecurities are rooted in past trauma. And third, it assumes that if we want to help leaders develop, we've got to help them heal from their past trauma and overcome their fears and insecurities. When we understand what vertical development is and these three assumptions, it helps us get a clear sense of the current state of leadership. Leaders are not as effective as we need them to be because they commonly hold fears and insecurities that, if left unaddressed, cause them to self-protect. Leadership development is not as effective as we need it to be because we primarily focus on horizontal development, which doesn't address the root of most leadership issues. And if we want to elevate the state of leadership, what we've got to focus on is vertical development and helping leaders heal from their past trauma. As we do so, we help them to overcome their fears so they operate from a place of security as opposed to a place of insecurity. At the beginning of this, I told you that I wanted to get you to think about leadership development differently in less than six minutes. I hope you now more clearly see that if you want to elevate in your effectiveness as a leader, or if you want to help other leaders elevate in their effectiveness, you've got to change your focus from horizontal development to vertical development. And this involves stepping into and healing from past trauma. To me, there's two things that we need in this world better leaders and more healing. And we can't have one without the other. So, what do you think? Now talk to me about that. You know, what do you think about more healing and better leaders?
because I knew what I had to face when I go in that building. Right. And I drowned myself with my kids, you know, and my, my um, you know, my schedule I had for them and my, my groups I had. I drowned myself in them so that I wouldn't have to think about, you know, her or be confronted with her. Yeah, it was rough, but uh, Absolutely. I turned it around. <laughs> Someone else? Say right now, uh, and I got this probably on another slide, but it's pushing me to say this. Some some of us need to have the Fetterman effect. Y'all know what happened to Senator Fetterman, friend? What happened? Because 
a leader is constantly and consistently learning at all times. Now the question is, is who you are is as important as what you are assigned to do. And what tasks, what are your tasks as a ministry leader? And what are you going to develop as a leader? What are some of the things we can do as a fellow as a leader? What do you think? Huh? Absolutely. I'm glad you said it. I have, I have these books set up. I have one called Baptist Polity. I have one called Team Factor. I have another one called Who Moved My Pulpit? If y'all haven't read that one before. Yeah, Who Moved My Pulpit? It's all about change in an organization. Because it talks about a pastor who just moved the pulpit and he got voted out. How do you affect change when people are so staunch in tradition? Stewardship. What God has given you. How do you able to take care? And take care of the people underneath you. Talks about membership. Membership in the house of God. What is required of a membership in the house of God? Prayer. See, this is why I'm it. Gotta learn how to continue to pray. Some people need help in prayer. Get you a book. Recite the same prayers that are in here. Don't think because now I lay me down to sleep, I pray to go up, I saw the key about that before we go. No, no, no. You need to graduate from that. Graduate. This is how you graduate. Then also, I love this guy right here. Dave Ramsey. Talk about money. You are more to be a Christian, to be a leader. You got to learn how to manage your money as well. You, you can learn anything about spiritual leadership, but you still got to live Monday through Saturday. How are you going to do that? Things like that. Teaching people how to evangelize as leaders. Are you ready to be baptized? Leading people to Christ. Also, words from the cross and the spiritual leadership. But more importantly, this is the main book we need to be reading. Is the Bible. These are one of the key things. As the good reverend said, you have to read. If you're not reading, you're not growing. If you're not implementing when you're reading, you're just a person just full of knowledge. And as a leader, to develop as a leader, you read and you put into practice. What is stopping people from putting what they need to read into practice? What do you think? Fear? Fear of what? Um, fear, fear of one exposure, fear of Fear of rejection, fear of exposure. I'm going to tell you one of, my, one of my biggest fears when I started out. I didn't want nobody to talk about it. If I got up and said something, I just knew somebody was whispering behind my back. And I was insecure about that. Not okay. But I was insecure about that. When I preached, I was very much insecure when I started out preaching. Because I wanted to be like the TDJ and Marcus Cosby and all of them. I wanted to set the church on fire when I was starting out. Man, I was like, I'm going to need to work out. But it says, I'm going to continue to develop as a preacher. But at the end of the day, guess what? I need to continue to develop. What other ways we can develop as leaders? Overthinking. Not overthinking. Just do it. Yes, sir. I have to be a big don't have a fear of making a mistake. Fear, not, not overthinking. Fear of making a mistake. It's easy said than done that. Huh? Am I right about it? But you guys what? You gotta overcome that fear. And one of the ways you overcome that fear is just do it. Take small steps. And once you take small steps, take bigger steps. And once you take bigger steps, you'll get the hand. I'm going to tell you right now, me starting out pastor, <laughs> mm, my Lord. Everything I say, everything I, I know about pastors from Pastor David. You know, and it was so much that he could teach me. He was like, hey, you got to step into it so you can learn. And once I stepped inside of learning, I started to learn people. But more important, I started to learn who I was as a person. I think I found out more who I was as a person in leading that I did about the people who I was with. Because the more I found out about myself, the more effective I could be for the people around me. So you got to take a step inside of the pool. Get out of the kiddie pool. Sometimes you just have to jump in and get your feet wet. Make mistakes. But also learn from those mistakes as well. All right.
different styles of leadership. God has made you very much unique. You have individual qualities, and guess what? A diverse person become, is a part of the body of Christ. No one can speak like you, talk like you, think like you. No one has the same uh, intonation as you. You are different. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be different. I'm a different kind of preacher. I'm a different kind of person. I'm a different kind of... I'm different. I, I've learned to accept this because no matter where I go, I say, why can't I be like him or like her or like this? I say, you are different. And you are who you are. So you got to be comfortable in your own skin who God has made you to be. And once you're able to do that, then you can be effective leader. And here it is. These are different styles of leadership. Teaching, preaching, worshiping, pastoral care, service and charity and justice, organizing and leadership. These are just different styles of leadership. Inside the body of Christ. But then, as you continue on and develop yourself, you have a direct style of leadership. You have a coaching style of leadership, supportive style of leadership, and delegating style of leadership. You need a little bit of everything. Because here, it says this style is useful when one outsources work to freelancers and contractors. When someone is so specific in what they do, Sometimes you have to learn how to direct them on what you exactly what you need. Just like creating a flyer. If someone's gift is creating a flyer, I'm going to be very direct and tell them I want this, this, and this. This is how I want it. And guess what? They go ahead and do it. I don't need to coach them because they're very specific in what they do. Coaching, yes, I'm able to give you the vision and you're able to take it with you. But also support ideas and delegate. Delegate says that I trust you with this. And as a leader, it is very scary. It is very scary. Scary to trust somebody with something because you don't want to fail. But you put it in somebody else's hands. And you pray, oh, I pray they don't mess this up. I pray they don't jack this up. Lord, I know they don't jack it up, but Lord, don't let them jack it up too much. It'll be on repair. Yes, it is hard for a leader. I'm telling you right, it is hard. But you guess what? The more you give people stuff and you trust them and you coach them and you train them, the more stuff you can give over to them. I'm telling you, it's hard. It's hard delegating. I'm telling you, it's hard. You have to be accountable to me. You want to name that stuff? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, right, Pat, one of the scariest things to be in the body of Christ is a pastor. I'm telling you right now, it is scary. Because you're trusting people to make sure that everything is all right. So I say fine. That's how you Even though you fumble the ball, I'm going to give it back to you again, just as you said. 
succeed. You have to give people a chance to succeed and not look at them as a failure. Because God has given you another chance. And I think that's very important because the person that failed you will never be acceptable again to do something else if he's not given another chance. He will carry that. And it will dwell in them and he can think that he's no good in anything. But if the leader gives you that second chance and say, I believe in you, and your downfall is here, and you have to be along the way, then that helps them to be able to say, yes, I can do it and give them the encouragement that they need. Trust is very vital to the love, and you have to have that relationship with people. And once you have a relationship with people, you can continue to trust. How many times have we messed up that God has given us another chance? Over and over and over again. And we have to have that same spirit of Christ in us to give people another chance and not hold that over there. That was in my mind. I ain't want to bring that up. Absolutely. How many times have our children you know, let us down? Play your room up.
got to get to the train station. We got to go here. We got to go there. They have just lost everything. And the person who wanted to get to the end was trying to pull somebody who was just going through a tra tragic loss. But it wasn't until Satan's sat down and empathized with them and be able to talk to him through his issues and his problems and was able to help him through it. And then guess what? They still made it to that destination anyway. What I'm saying that as leaders, communication is key. Sometimes, sometimes we go through it says, I thought you knew what I was working on. I, I, I did not know you needed to know or you should have told me. Those things there, how you communicate, what you say, and what you talk, how you talk to other people, that is always a misstep in communication. But the real leader is able to empathize with every last one of their particular members, whatever their leaders, or who they're leading, to ensure that whatever they're going through, someone hears them. Because the basic human need is for all of us to feel here, so to feel loved, and to feel respect. That is a basic human need. And as leaders, those are some of the key things that we need to do. There we go. All right. Pastor, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at my time, Pastor. I'm at my time. So I know there's, there's one other key thing that I want to do, but I, I, I want to be respectful of the time. So if you, if you give me a little bit for 10 minutes, I, I've got to be gone in 10 minutes, but it's not. You got to be All right. All right, good to go. So, I'm going to give you a nugget drop. Be prophetic. Prophetic means you need to cast a vision. Be transparent. Meaning that you have to tell people what's going on in the ministry all the time. Be bold as federal. Know when to seek out. Inspect what you expect. Don't gossip. Be a confidant. If someone tells you some secret about themselves or what they're going through, that is not for public display at all. Be focused. Too many irons in the fire and nothing gets done. Focus on what needs to be focused. Address immediate issues. If somebody did something wrong or says something wrong, address it right then and there. Do not allow stuff to linger for years, for weeks, for days. Address it. Be yourself. Matter of fact, people like, say, I am who I am. Guess what? No, no, no. Be who God transformed you to be. <laughs> That's the person that you need to be. Not terse, not tense, not, 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 not someone who's always brash, as I would say. Be diverse and talk with other leaders. Talk with one another. What are you going through? Have a routine. Devotional, workout. Also, seek alternate opinions. Don't be afraid of people who disagree with you. <laughs> Don't be afraid of people who disagree with you. You want alternate opinions so you can be strong. Respect authority and change of command. If the leader says we're going this way, this is the way we're going. Also, in meetings, bring something to the table and describe the problem and come with a solution and seek input. So, if there's a problem on the table, bring at least one solution. Don't bring up problems and no solution. I'm going to tell you right now, I cannot stand my brain to do that. Like, sir, we got this, this, and this. What's your solution? I didn't think about it. No, 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 no. Bring me a solution, then we can talk about the problem. Then also, always be prepared. Leaders are always prepared to give a speech, to say something, to inspire, to take notes, do whatever it is. Leaders are always prepared. Always with that. Not all that. All right. Development leaders. Development leaders. So one of the key things that I do want for you all to talk about is development leaders. I'm not going to go through it all, but I just I, I need to get through. I want to get through this portion real quick. And in this portion real quick, I want to talk about planning. I want to really get through this planning. Planning portion, we're going to do one thing yet, and I'm going to let you all go. But this planning thing yet is called a pre mortem exercise. So, whenever you stop planning an event, whenever you stop planning a ministry event, whatever you all want to do, what I'm going to suggest that you all do is a pre mortem exercise. 
you're a post one, right? What is most one? Uh, after something is dead, they let they put a Y and you try to figure out the cause of death. What I'm suggesting to you all is to do what is called a pre-mortem. A pre-mortem. Got six minutes. You're all right. Given that it is my plan, I'll start. 
unannounced that we fail because we lose cell service, we lose GPS, and become lost. I then turn to Bob, a fellow club member. He offers that we don't make it to the top because at 4 a.m. we are not prepared for the last leg. It is still dark outside as we try to pack up and we become delayed. What's the reason you came up with? Now it's time to address the failures as we move to step forward. After giving everyone two minutes to work independently, we once again go around the table. My failure, becoming lost, can be reduced by taking a compass and a map with us. With Bob's failure, we can establish a buddy system, carried enough to make sure that everyone is awake by 4 a.m. And we can make sure that we each bring a flashlight. What are some additional ways that we might fix these failures? What about a fix for the failure you came up with? Leave any ideas you might have in the comments, but keep in mind, the main purpose of the report is to help reduce overconfidence, not necessarily to have a fix for every potential issue. Now, in the final step, step five, we will use the insights gained in the previous steps to revise or modify our plan. Keeping our example in mind, I'm now going to share a few common mistakes people make when using a pre-mortem. One, instead of declaring that the plan has failed, asking what might go wrong. This is not the same thing. What might go wrong does not trigger the same mental shift required to explore failure. Two, no sense of urgency. Make sure to limit the discussion of failures or fixes to only a few minutes. Avoid becoming distracted by one element or aspect of the plan. Three, asking for volunteers. If a person is in the group, then they must participate in the process. There are no observers when using a pre warning This helps avoid a free rider effect. Four, not taking turns. Make sure that each person presents only one failure or one fix at a time. This helps to ensure that everyone will have some degree of ownership in the process. Five, not having a leader or facilitator. One person must take overall responsibility for the plan and keep everyone focused, develop a sense of urgency, and drive the process. To end the video, I want to encourage you to go ahead and schedule your very first pre-mortem using a short-term goal. Do it now. Put it on your to-do list. To give it a try, focus on something that you want to achieve within the next three months. If you want any additional help or have any questions about how to use the pre-mortem, visit the link in the description and send me a message. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to subscribe before you go, and thanks for stopping by.
somebody that's going to get us up and then I'm going to sleep. All right, brother. All right. Event number two. The church is planning an outreach event and they have contacted 12 vendors to provide essential services, resources, and products. The community has been notified and has been marketed on the radio for weeks. Only two vendors showed up. Why did it fail?
what we have uh, heard today and heard today uh, from Dr. Thomas. We are very appreciative and thankful and grateful to him uh, for allowing us uh, uh, to share and hear what God has placed on his heart for us uh, to glean from this. Uh, and everybody hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Glean from this today. I guess I'm going to do what I should do, and that is put my glasses on. So many of you know, and I'm just going to cut through the text right quick because uh, I, I, I do have someone else, somewhere else to be. I'm supposed to be in your point at 2.30. Dang, that ain't going to happen. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 this is fine. This is fine. I did a, I did a, I did a pre mortem on that. And, and I've already got things in place, people in place, just in case I couldn't get it. So, nonetheless. But Fourth Baptist Church has been given uh, the opportunity to partner with the Portsmouth Health uh, uh, Department, and we've been granted a COVID-19 uh, grant. And as we do that, uh, then we have probably provided adequate funds. I think the funds is in the amount of thirty thousand dollars totally, but we have to spend that in increments. Why am I saying that rather than approaching what Dr. Thomas said? We will come back to that. But I need you as leaders of the church, leaders in ministry, to think ahead about things that, that we can accomplish, uh, events and things of that nature here at the church, uh, so that we can include this in your uh, activities. In other words, if you can have an activity and we can wrap it around COVID-19, understanding it, bringing in uh, individuals to speak about it, then we don't have to use our money. We will use the money from the COVID grant. And, and that can be utilized in every ministry in the church. Okay? The only thing I ask you to do uh, is that when you do that, please contact Sister Cynthia Lewis. Uh, it's not her ministry. It's not her grant. But I have asked her to uh, be uh, the person responsible and in charge of this grant as we go forward. Okay? So I just need you to make sure that you... Uh, Think about this when you put your events together. Uh, we'll engage the mind, the body, and the spirit to fight against COVID-19 as we do that. So it has to be something wrapped around COVID-19 health issues. But we can do that in every ministry that we have. On our youth side, I want you guys to start thinking about if we're going to go out skating or something of that nature, bowling, as long as we can wrap that around uh, COVID and get an understanding of whatever it is about that, we can pay for your event uh, from those funds. But it has to be approved first uh, before you just go out and set something up. Is that all right? And Sister, Sister Lewis can give you more details. She wrote a very, very good uh, 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 note here for me. I mean, this is for y'all. It says, I am requesting ministers to work on behalf of our church to coordinate activities so that we can spend uh, the money for uh, this grant, not only internal of the church, but external of the church as well. Now, I'm talking right now to Reverend Williams from uh, Olive Branch, okay, who is the president of Portsmouth Volunteers for the Homeless, and uh, that, uh, that's a good event, a good place where we can also work. Now, we're, we're underprivileged, uh, our communities, places of that nature, we want to focus on that as well. So by him being the president of the organization, that gives us a, a great opportunity uh, to impact and influence that underprivileged community. Uh, patience, I saw your hand. Yes, um, as a matter of fact, that's something good because they got what they call the coldest night of the year event coming up, where they're going to meet down at the waterfront, so he probably will mention that. Okay, all right, now, he hasn't mentioned that too much, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll make sure we do that. So, uh, I, I'm kind of rushing through this right quick. But uh, if you can get with Sister Lewis as you plan your activities, uh, and we can uh, uh, make sure that your activity meets the requirements uh, that are needful and necessary to spend this money. Okay. We just can't say uh, that's because the ushers want to go out to dinner today. No, 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 George pays for that. Okay. He's not on the All right. Get you busy, get you involved with coming up with ideas and things of that nature where we 
can uh, spend the money. Okay? Uh, so please see Sister Lawson before you go out and plan something. Make sure that your event qualifies uh, for us to meet that uh, expenditure. Is that all right? I know I didn't do it justice, Cynthia, but nonetheless, that's what it's all about. All right? Now, Reverend Thomas, thank you so much, sir.